Brenda Chapman. Hello. Oops. I'd like to tell you the story of my mother. She was abandoned by her mother and her father when she was a baby and reluctantly raised by her grandparents. She, um, this was during the Great Depression, the 1920s and 30s. She attended a one-room schoolhouse, and there she met a young new teacher, um, a young woman who saw something in my mother that no one else had seen when my mother was about 10 years old. She saw in my mother the ability of an artist, a potential to be an artist. And so she wanted to teach my mother after um, school. So this uh, young teacher walked my mother home over two, excuse me, two miles to speak with uh, my mother's grandparents. And my mother's grandparents thought that this young woman was just putting ideas in my mother's head. And they said no. And this young teacher tried to encourage uh, them to, to say, hey, look, this young girl has potential. We shouldn't waste this potential. And for that, this young teacher was fired because my great-grandfather was on the school board. Now, the teacher was allowed to stay and finish out the year, uh, but my mother was not allowed to have the lessons. And, um, but this teacher kept her head high and with grace and dignity, continued teaching those children with a lot of passion, according to my mother. And she made a huge impression on my mother. One, because she saw my mother as someone who had something special and unique in her. But two, she also didn't see my mother as someone as a burden or someone she could use. Plus, she showed such great strength under adversity during this time. She left a huge impression, and my mother remembered this woman for life, and I heard about this woman for most of my life. But this, this wonderful, young, naive teacher gave my mother the seed of resilience. Um, after the teacher had left a few years later, my mother graduated from eighth grade, but then was forced to quit school because my great-grandfather thought it was a waste of time to educate a girl. So she got to stay home and work on the farm. She um, married my father when she was 17. She raised five kids over a period of 40 years. I'm the baby sitting on my mom's lap, and that's my big brother in the left-hand corner, Don. He's 21 years older than me. She had to help my dad make ends meet, and she worked in a sewing sweatshop in the 1940s. She worked as a school cook in the 1950s and 60s while also making wedding cakes on the side from home, um, all while raising children. In the 1970s, she babysat for the new working moms. And um, in the late 70s and early 80s, she started cooking again um, and being a cook at a nursing home. After my father died, uh, my mother was in her 60s, and she decided to get her GED and the equivalent to a college education. This was through the snail mail. There was still no internet at this time. And uh, she wanted to be the culinary supervisor and head cook at a very well-respected nursing home in the Midwest, which she did. Because one person, when she was just a little girl, saw potential in her and encouraged that and exampled resilience my mother had resilience. And to empower oneself, especially if you're a woman, you need to have resilience. Resilience is the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties, a toughness. Now, you may think, well, that's your mother's story. It's a long time ago. Things are different now. But not really. I mean, it may be a little bit better here in America, but in much of the rest of the world, my mother's story is still out there, if not worse. And definitely there is worse out there. Um, but even here in America, we still get paid less for doing the exact same job as our male counterparts. We still have fewer opportunities simply because we may want to start a family. Um, 
But the thing that I'm worried about most today is the complacency I see of a lot of young women about the box that society has put them in. And I feel it's our responsibility to make them aware of what society is doing. Otherwise, I don't think they realize that box is gonna get smaller. I mean, we need to teach them to stand up. We all need to stand up against the degrading, sexualized, the degrading sexualized imagery of the media. We need to stand up for ourselves at work and at school, and yes, even at home. We need to stop being taken for granted for stereotypes that are less than who we are. It's not right, and we do need to make a change. And resilience, I believe, is the key to that change, and it is teachable. But right now, it seems to be lying dormant in our young girls because they are trained to be passive and reactive to what happens to them, where young boys are encouraged to be proactive. I believe that role models can make that change and role models can teach resilience. Role models can be family members, they can be friends, they can be teachers, they can be men, they can be women, they can be you. My first role model was my mother. She taught me resilience. She didn't get to make a career out of her original passion, but she had the strength and the toughness to go forth and do something beautiful that she did love and create a new passion. My passion is storytelling through drawing, writing, and filmmaking. And thanks to my mother teaching me resilience, I've been able to make a career out of that passion. And I want to tell you a little bit of my story. In the 1980s, all I wanted to do was work for Walt Disney, as most kids who wanted to get in animation did. And there was only really one school that um, Disney looked to to get new talent, and that was a um, Ca California Institute of the Arts in Southern California, CalArts. So I put together a portfolio, I was all excited, I sent it in, I got my letter back, and I'd been rejected. And I, I just wanted to crawl into a hole and never come out again. <laughs> I was just devastated. But my mom wouldn't let me stay in that hole. She said, get up. You've got another year, work on your portfolio, try again. And if it doesn't work again, find something else. So I got up, I went back to my community college, which I'd been attending, and I worked with an art teacher there who saw that potential in me, a man who encouraged me. And a year later, I applied and was accepted. I was one of five women in a class of 34. And I went there for three glorious years, had a blast learning the process of animation. So at the end of that three years, I um, was ready. We were ready to put in our portfolios to Disney, see if we could do it. And I had learned over that course of time that I loved storytelling. And so I wanted to get into story. But that was a, I was told you weren't able to get into story. You had to get inside and work your way up. So I put together an entry level portfolio. But I put in my student film and a letter saying I'd eventually like to work towards a story-related position. And lo and behold, <laughs> much to everybody's surprise and my great joy, I was hired as a story trainee. And I was over the moon, crazy happy for about three seconds. That's when the executive who sat across the desk from me told me that I was hired because I was a woman that up the upstairs people were getting, um, they were getting flack because there were hardly any women in creative positions in animation, and there were zero in story. Because I was coming out of school, I was the right price, and they could, they'd only had to hire me for six months. If I didn't work out, they could send me on and get another token female. I kid you not, this man said this to me. <laughs> so, I was devastated. Talk about taking the wind out of your sails. I wanted to be hired because I was a good storyteller, not because I was a woman. So I decided, OK, I've got my foot in the door. I don't like how I have my foot in the door, but I've got it in there. So I'm going to work extra hard to prove that I should keep this job. But more importantly, I had to work extra hard to prove to myself that I deserved that job. And because of that resilience that my mother gave me, I did keep that job. 
and I worked, I have worked now on a lot of films that are now beloved, starting with The Little Mermaid. And I've worked not only at Disney, but at Pixar and at DreamWorks. And my career has been a roller coaster of ups and downs, but I love what I do. And I hang in there and I do it. On an encouraging note, CalArts in the 1980s only had 13% women, but today they have 52% women. And that's fantastic, not only for animation, but for the film industry in general, because we really need that out there. And I believe that that increase in number is simply because that there were a few of us, just a handful of us, that actually made it in the industry and were um, distant role models to those young women. They could see our successes, but they could also see our failures, thanks to the press and the internet. And I'm really glad of that, because I think failures are just as important as our successes. We have a lot to deal with, all of us, men and women, but women especially <laughs> in life, not only at work, but at home in different aspects of our life where there are a lot of insecure and very unhappy people who take that out on the rest of us through arrogance, through bullying, through manipulation, through political backstabbing, all of that kind of stuff we have to deal with. We all have. And I think it's our responsibility to role model for these young women how we handle those situations in a positive manner. And I know this isn't easy, but it is simple. We just have to stand up for ourselves. And for others who are dealing with that, I think that's important too. Whether you fail or succeed is kind of beside the point. It's the fact that you are showing that you have self-respect and resilience. And so when young girls see that, they can look at us and say, well, if she can do it, so can I. Girls need strong role models to, to realize their potential, to really have a goal to work towards. And there's some really wonderful women up here behind me that have done amazing things with their life and gotten through adversity and really done some wonderful things. And I think they're fantastic and great inspirations. But I believe that the most important, best role model is a, one with a personal connection. When you can look in a young girl's eyes and let her see that you see potential in her, one strong gesture of encouragement can have a long-lasting impact. I mean, my mother's teacher's legacy of resilience has affected three generations of women in my family so far, not to mention the men. And this isn't just geared towards doing well in your jobs. It's not just, it's for everything in your life. A healthy marriage requires resilience. A healthy divorce requires resilience. <laughs> um, raising families requires resilience. Self-respect in any walk of life requires resilience. As my mom did for me, I try to do for my daughter. I try to inspire by example. When I get knocked down, I get back up. I, I can respect myself for not giving up. The struggle is worth it. Giving up is not. I, I just don't want to go backwards. I, if I have to change my path, so be it, but I just don't want to go backwards. So I want you to think back, all of you, men and women, what were the struggles that you've had to fight for? What were the battles that you had to fight? Was there someone there for you that inspired you and encouraged you? If not, do you wish there had been? Do you want to change the world for your daughters, your nieces, your granddaughters, your cousins, any young girl in your life so that you can give them room to grow beyond where we are? I mean, maybe they won't have to fight some of the same battles we've had to fight. Maybe they can fight some battles that have more substance other than dealing with gender, gender issues. So I hope you do have someone in your life. And if you do, I want you to let them see that you see that potential in them and be their role model for resilience. Thank you.